if I proclaim the gospel, this gives me no ground for boasting, for an obligation is laid on me, and woe to me if I do not proclaim the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am entrusted with a commission. What then is my reward? Just this, that in my proclamation, I may make the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my rights in the gospel. For though I am free with respect to all, I have made a, myself a slave to all, so that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, though I myself am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, so that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that I might by all means save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. This is God's good word for us, God's beloved people. Thanks be to God. Amen. So, in my journeys, I have been blessed to see a lot of the world's great churches. I added a new one to my list a few months ago when I got to go to Hagia Sophia uh, in Istanbul, this giant 1,600-year-old church that for about a 1,000 years until the construction of St. Peter's Basilica was the grandest church on the planet. Mentioning St. Peter's, I've been there. I went there as a teenager. Um, in my 20s, I went to Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem um, as a kid um, and several times as an adult. I went to Notre Dame in Paris, as well as Saint-Chapelle and Sacré-Cœur, all in Paris. I have uh, uh, been in worship in uh, St. Paul's Cathedral in London. I actually got to sit up in the choir uh, during Evensong because of a weird happenstance of the Methodist pastor who was also on the staff there and snuck me and my godmother in. Anyways, I went to Westminster Abbey as an eight year old. I've seen a lot of churches. I've been to Sagrada Familia, this, uh, the beautiful uh, church by Gaudi uh, in uh, Barcelona, which I will tell you is beautiful on the inside and an acquired taste on the outside. But the inside is absolutely soaring. You understand what can, you know, what can happen when technology several hundred years newer or applied to the problem of how do you build a cathedral. I've been in the summit, the compact center, now Lakewood Church at Joel and Victoria Osteen Ministry. I've been to worship there. I actually got to sit up in the production booth, which is the coolest part of that whole space and watch not just the worship happen, but watch the TV crews all do what they're doing. I love I love church architecture. One of our great cultural legacies as a religion is the grand architecture that we have built up over 2,000 years in a real way, starting with Hagia Sophia in the 500s. But I also think that if Paul was to survey modern Christianity, if Paul was to survey the modern world, he probably wouldn't be shocked at the behavior of modern humans because he was familiar with the behavior of, of his contemporary Romans, which, if you really dig into it, was uh, not that different uh, from how we act today. He might be obviously be shocked by all the technological change. Set that aside for a second. I think that he would be ab he would be absolutely shocked at our real estate value as a religion. And I think the Corinthians, if they were to show up today, would not be shocked at all that we have some of the grandest architecture in the world, that part of how what we doubled down on was having, quite literally, some of the grandest architecture in the world as a way of welcoming folks in. See, the church in Corinth and Paul are in an argument, 
And that argument, we get one side of that argument in the letter that we call Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, even though it's probably not the first time he wrote to the Corinthians. And certainly the Corinthians wrote him first, and he is responding to a letter that they sent that we don't exactly have. But one of the things that clearly they are arguing about here in chapter 9 is Paul's status as an apostle. You see, there were other people, there were other traveling evangelists that were not Paul, that were also passing through Corinth, and they looked a lot different than him. Uh, they would come in, uh, they would live off of the, the, the uh, uh, gifts from the Corinthian church, uh, they would uh, brag about their credentials and their learning, and Paul, we think, in his ministry to Corinth, did none of those things, partly because he said he did none of those things. Paul did not live off of the largesse of the Corinthian church. He worked as a tent maker in the Agora. He worked as a tradesperson to support himself uh, through a lot of his ministry, uh, except those parts where he was in prison. It's really hard to be a tent maker in prison. Uh, he earned his own living. He was out in the Agora. And Although, Paul, although we know Paul to be a fairly learned guy, that seems not to be the thing he stressed in his ministry with the Corinthians. The other thing to know about our friends the Corinthians, and this comes up a lot when we read this letter, is that they are, to use an old term, highfalutin. The Corinthians are uh, richer, uh, more powerful, uh, more erudite, uh, more culturally relevant, uh, there's a, a, a Christian theologian, Clarence Jordan, who translated all of the uh, Bible into the rural South. And what he would do is he would call uh, the Corinthians First Church Corinth, right? They are First Church Corinth. They are uh, very uh, thinking highly of themselves. They think of that they are high status people and they uh, want a religion that looks uh, very high status. And Paul, as stated by him is not doing that, and his point is that does not invalidate his ministry. It is, to his mind, how this is meant to work. That the Corinthians, then, if you flash forward, would not be shocked that Christianity owns some of the most valuable real estate in the world, and there is real logic to that. It is the same logic as Greek and Roman temples. It is the same logic that some version of religion has been practicing for as long as there has been human civilization. Where were the ziggurats? In the middle of the city. Where are the pyramids? In prominent view. Where are the Greco-Roman temples? In the center of cities. Sometimes they are the cities. They have their purpose for the cities. Is you go, oh, the, at the very center is the temple to Jupiter or Isis or Cyrus or pick whoever, right? We've always been doing this. Where you can walk the streets of Rome today and it is a mismatch of prominent Roman religious sites, the Pantheon, and prominent Christian sites, St. Peter's Basilica, both within a relatively easy walk of one another. Across the square from Hagia Sophia is the Blue Mosque. They literally face each other. They're now both mosques. It's, it's two stadium-sized mosques. It's, it's not just Christianity that suffers this in the modern era. It's two stadium-sized mosques facing each other across what used to be the old hippodrome, the old, uh, the old racetrack. And again... There is a real logic to this, and it's held us in reasonably good stead for a couple of thousand years, or certainly since we can start building structures in about the year 400, um, and it really gets going with Justinian and our good friend Hagia Sophia. You show through architecture how grand and important God is, People will see that, and we and will be drawn to that. Why do you build the biggest church in the world? To show that you have need 
of the biggest church in the world. Why does a, a cathedral have a ceiling just so high so that your eye will be drawn up and you will comprehend what it is to look to the heavens? Often there have scenes of heaven. They are painted on the ceiling so that your eye would be drawn up and there is the heavens. And it becomes this met powerful metaphor for the grandeur and power of God to draw your eye heavenwards. Also, in an era before internet advertising, um, the, a really giant building is a heck of a billboard to God is here, please come here. And again, this is logic as old as time. It predates us as a faith. It certainly predates our modern era why do, you put, uh, why do you buy the basketball stadium? Well, to make the statement that you have a church big enough that it could fill a basketball stadium. And you know what? He's right. Uh, his, his basketball stadium feeds about 12,000. He has a membership of 45,000, right? They've got to have multiple services in the basketball stadium. It's a heck of a statement about how many folks you got. And so if you want to worship a lot of folks, you go there. It's not bad logic. All I'm pointing out is it's not what Paul would do. It is not what Paul did. And it's not just because Paul would have gotten killed if he tried to build a building. When he had the opportunity to play the status game, to show God's importance through his importance, he turned it down. And instead, worked desperately to relate to as many different people as possible in order to win them over to the gospel. That what he practiced wasn't a statement of grandeur, but to show God's profound empathy. Paul didn't grow up a working class guy. He grew up, we think, in the middle class. He grew up uh, within the bounds of the Roman Empire, um, Acts makes the claim uh, that Paul was, in fact, a Roman citizen. Um, it actually becomes a really important plot point in the book of Acts because it's why he can go to Rome for trial because he is a Roman citizen. We know not just from Acts, uh, but also from Paul's own statements that he's, and also Paul's writing ability, that Paul's a really educated guy, that he got a pretty decent Greco-Roman education. And so if you read his rhetoric, if you really break down his rhetoric and his ability to write, he is a very classically trained uh, Greco-Roman author. Uh, he also trained under Gamaliel, a leading Pharisee. And so if you want to think about it this way, the way I often talk about it is he got a really good undergrad degree somewhere, and then I got a master's at Pharisee University. He is the college boy of the early Christian movement, right? Uh, Peter, God love him, but he's, an, he's a fisherman, right? Um, and a very good leader, but he was not a college boy. Peter did not go to Pharisee University. Paul did. And so Paul is this, like, highly educated middle class, upper middle class kid, setting out on the dirt road, living hand to mouth as a tent maker, which is clearly not the way he grew up, all for the sake of the gospel. He ends up in prison a lot. He ends up shipwrecked. Gets killed by the Romans. For though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I might win more of them. The Jews... I became a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, Gentiles, I became as one outside the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, so that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that I might by all means, save some. I do this all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessing. Paul is so absolutely moved by a call to save people. 
that he will go anywhere and live in any way. That he doesn't want to be an economic burden on the community, and so he works as a tent maker while also founding churches. There are not enough people able to preach the gospel yet, so he's traveling all over the known world and dies with plans to go even further that he just doesn't get to live out. Fundamentally, Paul's approach to ministry is one that says, what my comfort zone is doesn't matter. These people need to hear what God, this obligation that God has put in me. That it doesn't matter what the status looks like. What matters is, are people being reached? How can we, he, go to where the people are? Not expect them to wander in to high status spaces. And again, I'm not saying there's something inherently wrong with big, beautiful churches, I love them. They're beautiful and huge and a testimony to the grandeur of God, a testimony to the power of God working in huge ways in the lives of people for hundreds and thousands of years. Yes, absolutely, all of those things. I'm just telling you it's not what Paul said we were supposed to be doing and not what Paul took on for himself. And so if we're trying to think of a biblical Christianity... We've got to go back to what's in the Bible. Not to sound obvious for a second. And so if we're thinking about evangelism in a world that doesn't know that they need us and it does not seem particularly interested in merely attending high-status buildings, the Bible actually has a methodology for that. It's what got us started in the first place. But the testimony of Paul, and Paul gives a testimony of what that meant to him. What that meant to him was stepping outside of his comfort zone to go to where the people were, are, and love them so that some might be saved. That he let go of his comfort zone. He was very comfortable in the world of Pharisees. He was very comfortable in the world of the learned. Blessedly, we have his writings to testify to just how smart and well-read this guy was. That he became a tent maker and traveled the dustiest roads, took tremendous personal risks. And even when he had the opportunity Corinthians would put him up and pay his bills and it would all look like modern pastor's retreats. Very comfortable. He deliberately chooses the other way. Even when he didn't have to be in the Agora as a tent maker, he chose to be in the Agora as a tent maker so that he might save some. Friends, I, I, I make no claim to know the exact ways that God wants us to live and move in the world as a faith and to try and reach folks. If I, if I had the answers to that, maybe I'd have the basketball stadium. I have no idea. But I do know in my soul and hear clearly in Paul that it does involve a willingness to set aside our comfort zone for the sake of winning some. That the world doesn't know that they need us, simply erecting higher, more higher status structures is not what Paul would do. Paul stepped outside of his comfort zone, built relationships, and in that way, built the church that we still get to be a part of today. So as we reflect on our own lives, not just our ministry as a collective body called Servants of Christ United Methodist Parish, but as we reflect on our own lives, the question is, are we willing 
to let go of our comfort zone and empathize with people in the midst of their real lives? That's the question. At the heart, to me, of our modern crisis of faith, It isn't that humanity became somehow so much worse than it used to be. You should read about Roman morals. They were terrible. Is it that we forgot or never learned to let go of our comfort zone and empathize with people to be all things to all people rather than expecting all people to be what we want them to be. At some point, we've got to ask ourselves, is being comfortable what we were called for? Or is it to be as Paul was, uncomfortable, so that the world may know the love 